Oil facilities burning in the Middle East again, and this time, Saudi Arabia says Iran did the damage. Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, um, it is difficult to be an American who's lived through a couple of Gulf Wars without wondering what's going to happen next in this situation, where the uh, Saudi Aramco state-owned uh, oil facilities were hit at first uh, by drones and missiles that were um, attributed to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. But both uh, Saudi Arabia and our own State Department and President Trump have said that, no, in fact, it was Iran that did the shooting. Um, Bill, this I don't want to leap right into uh, the United States question because that just seems like the natural pace to go because we are so provincial and concerned about our own needs. Uh, but, Bill... Here we are, uh, you're Saudi Arabia. Iran hits your oil facilities and knocks about half of them offline. What do you do next? You declare war on the on the country that launched this unprovoked attack and this act of aggression that is, in fact, an act of war without any question. If you can think of something that if you can think of something like this as not being an act of war, then you're mentally ill. It's almost impossible to picture a better definition of an act of war than for me to take a missile, fly it over from my territory to your territory and blow up something you own. That's pretty much pretty much as clear as it gets. So, Bill, this is uh, this is not um, a small potatoes war we'd be talking about. Iran is heavily armed. Saudi Arabia is heavily armed. Uh, Saudi Arabia in particular with our weapons. Um, Iran uh, has weapons sourced from various places. Uh, one would assume much of that from the so uh, yes, Soviet Union, from Russia. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, kind of conflagration or breakout of an actual shooting war between the two of them, which you say already is in a state of existence, uh, couldn't help but draw in some of the partners of these countries, no? No. I don't know why it would have to draw on any of the partners of these countries. Um, you, I really like the way you set up this episode, uh, having both lived through a number of Gulf Wars. You know, we saw Gulf One, saw the Iraq War and all that other stuff. So I can tell you with a pretty high degree of certainty what is not going to happen. In fact, I can tell you with virtually 100 percent certainty what's not going to happen. What's not going to happen is American troops are going to go land and uh, put their boots down in Saudi Arabia. That That's not going to happen. And now, Bill, is that just happen. because of the war weariness of the United States or because uh, technological advances have made it so that we don't have to put boots down on the ground in Saudi Arabia and still we can be involved? Well, probably both. But... Um, but the point of it is, is that this this kind of a of an action. This is why I'm actually mystified by this. I'm not mystified by it when when I'm just surprised at at how how they could be this stupid. Um, when we had the drone attacks on the tankers a couple months ago, I guess got a lot of feedback from people who were just right, sort of visitors to this site, saying, uh, you know, you're a warmonger and 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 you're going to start a war and stuff. And we said then. Uh, what what basically what we're saying now, and that is that when you are dealing with a regime like Iran, when you're dealing with a thugocracy, they will continue to provoke you until they find out where that line is. And they set tankers on fire. And apparently Donald Trump was about to throw the lightning bolt and and he stayed his hand at the last minute. Um, and so they went and and escalated significantly. Uh, perhaps they're stupid enough to think that by um, by John Bolton either being fired or resigning, however you want to put it, perhaps they thought that was an indication that Donald Trump is weak and that, that America doesn't have the stomach for this kind of thing. We we are not going to be in a ground war in Saudi Arabia, but with one uh, with one flourish of the pen, uh, we could make Iran's military establishment disappear, and I don't think we I don't think we'd suffer a, a hangnail from it. Honestly. Now, what uh, kind of flourish of the pen would that be, Bill? What are you talking about there? Well, the president could declare could declare either a state of war could make it uh, part of the presidential you know, prerogative. That's what's really happened mostly these days it, for the for most of the time since uh, the World War Two. Uh, military actions have not been open declarations of war with um, the approval of the Congress. And, and I don't like that. But nevertheless. It is clear to me that all of Iran's military installations, all of their aircraft, all of their patrol boats, all of that stuff could be gone in, a, in, in within a pretty clean 24 hours without a single U.S. Uh, 
certainly without any soldiers on the ground and very likely without any real risk to most of our airmen. I think the whole thing could be done standoff at long range really at this point. But we would be the ones engaging in that so-called kinetic action. We would be the ones engaging with Saudi Arabia when an attack on an ally, an unprovoked act of war from a rogue nation that has been at war with the United States since 1979. I don't want to hear anybody tell me, how do you dare talk about starting a war with Iran? Iran has been at war with the United States since 1979. Virtually all of the casualties we took in the Iraq war were the result of Iranian IEDs planted by Iranians, designed by Iranians, supplied by Iranians, and so on. So if it doesn't take a burning oil refinery to make it clear that this rogue regime is at war with the rest of the world, then I don't know what it's going to take, but I suspect that this is certainly clear enough for action on the part of, uh, of the United States and Saudi Arabia, which I might point out is not short of either weapons or cash. Now, Bill, um, as, as of the time that we're recording this, which is uh, Monday evening, September 16th, um, Iran is saying they didn't do it. Um, uh -huh. This sounds like uh, Saddam Hussein saying we don't have those weapons of mass destruction you think we have. Well, the, the difference between these two things is that is that the actual attack, the actual weapon was was used. The whole thing with the weapons of mass destruction, which was one of reasons, not all, not the only reason that, that we went into Iraq, was this, we were looking for the smoking gun. Well, we don't have to find a smoking gun here. The gun is smoking, the oil fields are smoking. Iran could say it was done by uh, rebels from Yemen if they want to, but we have radar tracks and so do the Saudis. This is solid, incontrovertible evidence of where these attacks came from. We know exactly precisely where they came from. And we had uh, an explosion on a missile pad in, in um, Iran just a week or two ago. So we know exactly where they came from and we know exactly where they were headed to. We know who, who launched them. Now the question is, what are we gonna do about it? I don't know why they launched them, I have not been able to figure it out because honestly, I just really think that they have been so used to twisting the, the tail of this tiger and getting away with it that I don't think they really fathom what we are actually capable of doing by remote control. And I mean by remote, remote control. I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, tomahawk strikes from, from vessels that are a thousand miles at sea or 600 miles or and whatever the range And drones being of the piloted from Kansas. All of it. All of it. I don't think we would or should risk a single U.S. Uh, life in this, but they, but Iran has no idea the kind of hurt that we can inflict from long range without any danger to our troops whatsoever. So, Bill, and some I people think, would say- I think they're about to find out. As you've said, Iran has been at war with us since 19, since with us meaning U.S., since mm -hmm. 1979. Um, and we have been allies with Saudi Arabia, but that relationship has been a fraught one. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything from the idea that uh, we are supplying weapons to them, um, the people who, uh, what was it? How many of the 19 uh, hijackers were Saudi uh, descent? Um, in addition to the fact that uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who was uh, a Washington Post uh, freelancer or reporter, um, who was killed under mysterious circumstances, and many yep. people think that the Saudi regime was behind that action. How is it, Bill, that we are able to put that uh, out of our minds and still be a moral force in the world and say, you know, essentially we're on the side of Saudi Arabia in this one? I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I think they're the worst so-called ally that we have. I think they're the source of a great deal of our problems. Saudi money has been uh, funding a number of radical jihadi uh, outfits. The whole the whole Wahhabi movement is is basically Saudi in nature. And Saudi Arabia, I think you could make a pretty compelling case, has been at war with America since the mid 70s or certainly since the mid 80s as well. I think certainly before that. So now what we've got is a situation where we are looking at the number one exporter of of Shiite terrorism in, in Iran and the number one exporter of Sunni terrorism in Saudi Arabia at a situation now where they are going to be uh, having some stern discussions between the two. So why not just if say you, a pox on so both your houses and I hope do they manage to uh, I do deplete say, each other's forces dramatically on both sides? I do, I do say a pox on both their houses, but the without question, I don't think there's any question whatsoever that the number one 
that the number one threat to U.S. security in terms of, of, of the safety of its, of its citizens is Iran and has been for a long time. Needless to say, China and Russia pack bigger punches, but they are run by governments. They're not run by lunatics. And this act seems to me to be the line that cannot be uncrossed. I really, I cannot imagine there not being a military response to this. And that makes me wonder why they're doing it. it. Makes me think that perhaps that regime is in a lot more trouble domestically than they thought. But if they think that the Iranian people are gonna rally behind them the way they did in 1979, they're in for a very large surprise. It's time for this regime to go, Scott. It's time for these lunatics to go, not just in for Tehran. our benefit, Yes, not just for our benefit, not just for the benefit of Saudi Arabia and their oil and their oil sheikdom. And, uh, no, mostly for the benefit of the Iranian people. It is time for these thugs and murderers to go. And when they commit an act this brazen, to me, it's justification for pushing that dry, you know, that dry erase button on um on the president's desk. And I'm not talking about civilian uh, centers, needless to say. I'm talking about precisely the opposite of that, which is why I think the, the, the strike on the oil fields was so stupid, because it is possible, with, it's just really, I don't wanna say it's simple, but it's within, easily within our means to essentially eliminate Iran as a, as a military force for the, for the foreseeable future in, in, an, in, a, in an hour. We can do this. Bill, and one might argue that if it was Iran, which they claim the Iranian uh, regime Iran. claims it was not, but if it was well, Iran, it was. that they were demonstrating restraint by hitting an industrial facility rather than a population center. Well, you could, if, if you're saying that the war is already on and, and Iran is just retaliating, you'd better provide some evidence of that initial strike because all I see, looking back to 1979, which is what, uh, uh, 40 years now? is nothing but Iranian attacks that go unanswered. I don't see any attacks on Iran from either the, the Israelis or the Saudis or the Americans or the Kuwaitis for that matter. This is a one-way street. It's been going on forever. I think they think they can get away with it. They had a previous administration that gave them $800 million on cargo pallets, cargo pallets full of $100 bills to get up to this kind of mischief. And now they're going to, look, you can hardly blame them in a way Right. I mean, if you have an administration that preceded this one and is ready to give them eight hundred million dollars to please not hurt us, what do you think you're going to get if you get forty years of that kind of tepid response from 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 uh, the United States and and Saudi Arabia? The thing that these the thing that these uh, forget the Iranians, the thing that these progressives do not understand at all and will never understand ever is the reason that we need to strike these people is because I am so set against the idea of war. I am against the idea of, of violence and uncontrolled uh, terrorism. And that's why when the bully pushes you, you have to hit him in the nose. If One, you don't, it never, ever, ever ends. And it's been going on for 40 years now, and I think it's way, way past time for it to stop. I think it's time for the Iranian uh, regime to go. I think that their entire regime is predicated on fear and on, and on their military power, which is, which is not capable of touching us, but we are certainly capable of touching them. And the only threat I see that Iran holds over us would be some sort of unrestrained terrorism around the world. I'm not shrugging that off, but I am saying that time is working for them and not for us. They get stronger every day. They get closer to nuclear weapons every day. And, and why they launched this attack, I do not know, but this is not, look, Scott, it's not like these things just blew up, you know, where you could say, well, we know that, that Saudi Arabia did it, but we can't prove it. There are missile tracks, there are radar tracks of, of, of these strikes coming from Iran. What else do you need? So uh, one could uh, argue that years ago, uh, an outbreak of war in this region of the world would have been devastating to the United States because of our heavy reliance upon Mideast oil. However, this now is that another the United major States point. is a net exporter of petroleum products, that is a less significant threat to us. However, Bill, we still have a nation of friends in a tiny little strip of land in that area of the world. And it is hard to imagine Iran going very far into this process without deciding that if they want to hurt the United States and or Saudi Arabia, uh, taking a few shots at Israel would be to their benefit as well. 
I don't think that is an enemy they want to engage. Uh, and I don't think that Israel would have to necessarily be involved in any of this stuff because technically speaking, Israel is sitting on the sidelines of this one, at least in terms of where the actual missiles came from and, and where they landed. Uh, but that regime has, has, has launched continuous terror attacks into Israel through Hamas and Hezbollah and all the rest of this stuff. And, and, I, and I just don't see that we're going to sit still for this. And when I say we, I mean the rest of the world. I don't mean the United States on our throne. I mean the rest of the world has had enough of this. Should you President know, Trump tankers. be pulling together a coalition of the willing to resist Iran at this point? No, I don't know if that's even necessary, Scott, because a coalition of the willing is simply just political fig leaf. There's no other country in the world that can do what we can do to Iran. There's no one else that can do what we can do to Iran. And to and to gather a coalition is going to be would be a six month long process that would be that would be ending up exactly where we saw it end up before. And we get into inspections and all the rest of this nonsense. I don't think Donald Trump has the patience for it. I certainly don't. And I don't think the U.S. military does either. If there is if there has never been I cannot I cannot recall a more brazen act of war on the part of a country that I live to see than this. And and the longer you wait to retaliate, the worse it's going to be. I don't think, you know, there are cases where where you hesitate to throw the book at somebody because their guilt is 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 Maybe it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's not. It's not locked in in stone. This is DNA evidence. This is this is the this is the guy with the bloody knife in his hand. We saw the strike. We knew where it came from. We knew where it landed, and and whether uh, Americans like it or not, Saudi Arabia is an ally of ours. And while I think they're their most unsavory of allies, I also think that if you allow Iran. To, to simply strike at tankers in the in the uh, Straits of Hormuz, and if you allow Iran to to send drone strikes to blow up other countries' facilities without a response, then you are absolutely walking down the Munich path that we have seen in very recent history, and we know where this ends. It's not a mystery. None of this is a mystery. I'm saying we hit these guys hard with our with our long range capabilities, not because I like war, but because I would like to stop this one before it gets to the point where it's going to require more than that. I think it's time for them to pay a price for for the the cruelty and the barbarity of that regime. And I think that this I think they're messing with the wrong president. That's what I think. I, I think these. I think these mullahs and these generals on some level looked at, at Donald Trump staying his hand after the drone attack on the tankers and basically came to the conclusion he's essentially another Obama. I, if I had to guess, I would say his refusal to strike after the tankers and his um, and, the, and the departure of, um, jo of John Bolton, I think those two things together convinced these lunatics that it was worth the risk to escalate this thing and find out where the uh, where the line in the sand is. And for eight years, there was no line in the sand. And now they're going to find out that there is, in fact, a line in the sand. And they're going to find out that they're on the wrong side of that line. They have read his professed mercy as a sign of weakness. Uh, final question, Bill. Um, this is uh, once we the shooting said, starts in a, in a war situation like this, um, it's easy to immediately lose your grip on principles and foreign policy policy doctrines, so to speak. Um, let me just ask your insight into what do you think this kind of situation uh, says or should make us think about when it comes to conservative foreign policy doctrine? Well, this is, I, I, I almost take exception with, your, with the expression when the shooting starts. I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of shooting. I don't think there's going to be any shooting. There is going to be a there. I suspect there is no, the going shooting to be, that has already happened. I'm not saying of future events. Okay. I'm saying this. What is no, no, already I'm saying, transpired. I'm saying if you if you are envisioning tanks going across the desert at each other, you don't understand the the nature of that battlefield. It's that I don't think that is. 
I, I can't see a world not, where not that at happens. all. That's not a scenario I'm putting forth. I'm just saying, based on the fact that there's already been a, a drone uh-huh. and missile strike, what as a conservative, what do you fall back on when it comes to your principles and and sort of foreign policy doctrine? Oh. How do how well, now do we live in a situation like this? Well, that's 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 a lot more simple for me to answer. Uh, as far as our morality goes, we continue with the same level of morality that I've witnessed with my own eyes over the last ten years. I have been at the at the nerve center at CENTCOM. I've met the people at CENTCOM. I've met the people and know some of the people who put those drones off, uh, the strikes off of the rails on the drones and down on targets. And I have seen again and again and again and again and again those strikes called off because there was no certainty that they could be accomplished without civilian casualties. So our our moral obligation in a fight against this kind of terrorist regime is to make sure that we do everything within our power that that this is a strike against military targets and against military personnel and that civilians are out of the of the firing range and if civilians are in the line of fire then you don't take the shot that's what that's what our policy has been and i've been exceedingly proud of that now that said you you we are not just dealing with we're not dealing with a tit for tat here we're not dealing with the well okay well who cares if if saudi arabia got hit on some level, I don't care that Saudi Arabia got hit. As you said before, thank God for American ingenuity and the ability to, to uh, produce. We're a net exporter of oil now. If this had happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we'd be in an entirely different boat. So you could say, hey, you know what? None of our business, a pox on both your houses. I hope you guys go at it. I hope you both, I hope you guys bur- both burn each other's house to the ground. That is not what's at stake here. What's at stake here is the ability of a nation among a family of nations to launch an unprovoked missile attack on another nation and get away with it. That's what's on, that's what's on the table here, is the, is the ability for rogue states to simply do what they want to, attack who they want to without provocation and get away with it. They've been getting away with it since 1979. And if you don't think North Korea is going to watch how we respond to this, you're out of your mind. Somebody is going to have to make these people pay for this aggression. Somebody's going to have to make it cost them, and we're going to have to make it cost them more than they gain. So they want to launch this missile attack. I get the feeling that when the dust is settled, Iranian leadership is going to discover that we have more missiles than they do. I think that's probably what's good. The lesson coming out of this little adventure on their part will be. But it's no question It's no question a continuing escalation. And so you have to ask yourself as a rational person, why are they doing this? Why? You're going to find, if you are a really rational person, you're going to find that sometimes other people in the world aren't rational. That's the conclusion you're going to come to. Some people are not smart enough to figure out that not everybody's that smart. That's not my problem. I know what history looks like. I know, I know what I know what the opening stages of conflict look like. I know what it looks like when you respond to this kind of aggression. And I know what it looks like when you don't. So I think that they have made a very serious miscalculation. And I think that they think that this is the kind of thing that probably worst case scenario would respond with a maybe a strike on one of their, uh, you know, airfields or something like that. This this is a this is a sick 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 rabid animal and this Iranian government and it doesn't represent the people of its country it murders its own people and it needs to be put down and it's way past time to do it and I don't know if this is not enough then I don't know what would be enough I can think of something but I don't want to think of it A refuge for rational thought, civil dialogue, and the testing of time-tested principles. BillWhittle.com is the place where our members gather to discuss the news of the day in the context of these enduring ideas. Um, If you'd like to become one of them, you can go to BillWhittle.com and click that Become a Member link and become one of the people who actually produce this and some four dozen other shows every month. We will follow this situation in the Middle East as events warrant, and we're glad to have the members there making it possible. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thank you.